Welcome to another episode of Mike Reads. Today we'll be continuing our series on Henry Hazlitt's economics in one lesson with chapter 22, The Function of Profits. As I've mentioned throughout the course of this series, we are doing this series as a parallel read with Thomas Sowell's Economic Facts and Fallacies, which we actually just finished up. So I'll put a link in this video's description so you can follow along there as well. As I've also mentioned throughout the course of this series, at the end of each read, we'll be doing an analysis and review of the read. So I'll put a timestamp in this video's description so you can jump straight to the analysis and review part of the video if that's how you'd like to go about things. So without further ado, let's dive into tonight's read, which is chapter 22, The Function of Profits. The indignation shown by many people today at the mention of the very word profits indicates how little understanding there is of the vital function that profits play in our economy. To increase, to increase our understanding, we shall go over again some of the ground already covered in chapter 15 on the price system, but we shall view the subject from a different angle. <clears throat> Profits actually do not bulk large in our total economy. The net income of incorporated business in the 15 years from 1929 to 1943, to take some illustrative figures, averaged less than 5% of the total national income. Corporate profits after taxes in the five years from 1956 to 1960 averaged less than 6% of the national income. Corporate profits, corporate profits after taxes in the five years 1971 through 1975 also averaged less than 6% of the national income, in spite of the fact that, as a result of insufficient accounting adjustment for inflation, they were probably overstated. Yet profits are the form of income toward which there is most hostility. It is significant that while there is a word profiteer to stigmatize those who make allegedly excessive profits, there is no such word as wage ear or loss ear. Yet the profits of the owner of a barbershop may average less not merely than the salary of a motion picture star or the hired head of a steel corporation, but less even than the average wage for skilled labor. The subject is clouded by all sorts of factual misconceptions. The total profits of General Motors, the greatest industrial corporation in the world, are taken as if they were typical rather than exceptional. Few people are acquainted with the morale mortality rates for business concerns. They do not know, to quote from the TNEC studies, that, quote, should conditions of business averaging the, exist the experience of the last 50 years prevail, about seven of each 10 grocery stores opening today will survive into their second year. Only four of the 10 may expect to celebrate their fourth birthday, end quote. They do not know that in every year from 1930 to 1938, in the income tax statistics, the number of corporations that showed a loss exceeded the number that showed a profit. How much do profits, on the average, amount to? This question is commonly answered by citing the kind of figures I presented at the beginning of this chapter, that corporate profits average less than 6% of the national income, or by pointing out that the average profits after income taxes of all manufacturing corporations are less than $0.05 cents per dollar of sales. For the five years 1971 through 1975, for example, the figure was only $0.4.6 cents. But these official figures, though they fall far below popular notions of the size of profits, apply only to corporation results, calculated by conventional methods of accounting. No trustworthy estimate has been made that takes into account all kinds of activities, unincorporated as well as incorporated business, and a sufficient number of good and bad years. But some eminent economists believe that over a long period of years, after allowance is made for all losses, for a minimum quote-unquote riskless interest on invested capital, and for an imputed quote-unquote reasonable wage value of the services of people who run their own business, no net profit at all may be left over, and that there may even be a net loss. This is not at all because entrepreneurs people who go into business for themselves, are, in, are intentional philanthropists, but because their optimism and self-confidence too often lead them into ventures 
that do not or cannot succeed. <clears throat> it is clear in any case that any individual placing venture capital runs a risk not only of earning no return, but of losing his whole principle. In the past, it has been the lure of high profits in special firms or industries that has led him to take that great risk. But if profits are limited to a maximum of, say, 10% or some similar figure, while the risk of losing one's entire capital still exists, what is likely to be the effect on the profit of incentive and hence on employment and production? The World War II excess profits tax showed what such a limit can do, even for a short period, in undermining efficiency. Yet governmental policy almost everywhere today tends to assume that production will go on automatically, no matter what is done to discourage it. One of the greatest dangers to world production today still comes from government price-fixing policies. Not only do these policies put one item after another out of production by leaving no incentive to make it, but their long-run effect is to prevent a balance of production in accordance with the actual demands of consumers. When the economy is free, demand so acts that some branches of production make what some government officials regard as quote-unquote excessive, unreasonable, or even obscene profits. But that very fact not only causes every firm in that line to expand its production to the utmost, and to reinvest its profits in more machinery and more employment, it also attracts new investors and producers from everywhere, until production in that line is great enough to meet demand, and the profits in it again fall to or below the general average level. In a free economy in which wages, costs, and prices are left to the free play of the competitive market, the, sp the prospect of profits decides what articles will be made, and in what quantities, and what articles will not be made at all. If there is no profit in making an article, it is a sign that the labor and capital devoted to its production are misdirected. The value of the resources that must be used up in making the article is greater than the value of the article itself. One function of profits, in brief, is to guide and channel the factors of production so as to apportion the relative output of thousands of different commodities in accordance with demand. No bureaucrat, no matter how brilliant, can solve this problem arbitrarily. arbitrarily. Free prices and free profits will maximize production and relieve shortages quick, quicker than any other system. Arbitrarily fixed prices and arbitrarily limited profits can only prolong shortages and reduce production and employment. The function of profits, finally, is to put constant and unremitting pressure on the head of every competitive business to introduce further economies and efficiencies, no matter to what stage these may already have been brought. In good times, he does this to increase his profits further. In normal times, he does it to keep ahead of his competitors, and in bad times, he may have to do it to survive at all. For profits may not only go to zero, they may quickly turn into losses, and a man will put forth greater efforts to save himself from ruin than he will merely to improve his position. Contrary to a popular, popular impression, profits are achieved not by raising prices, but by introducing economies and efficiencies that cut costs of production. It seldom happens, and unless there is a monopoly it never happens over a long period, that every firm in an industry makes a profit. The price charged by all firms for the same commodity or service must be the same. Those who try to charge a higher price do not find buyers. Therefore, the largest profits go to the firms that have achieved the lowest costs of production. These expand at the expense of the inefficient firms with higher costs. It is thus that the consumer and the public are served. Profits, in short, resulting from the relationships of costs to prices, not only tell us which goods it is most economical to make, but which are the most economical ways to make them. These questions must be answered by a socialist system no less than by a capitalist one. They must be answered by any conceivable economic system, 
and for the overwhelming bulk of the commodities and services that are produced, the answers supplied by profits and loss under competitive free enterprise are incomparably superior to those that could be obtained by any other method. I have been putting my emphasis on the tendency to reduce costs of production because this is the function of profit and loss that seems to be least appreciated. Greater profit goes, of course, to the man who makes a better mousetrap than his neighbor as well as to the man who makes one more efficiently. But the function of profit in rewarding and stimulating superior quality and innovation has always been recognized. That concludes tonight's read. Now on to the analysis and review part of the video. All right, welcome to the analysis and review part of the video. So before we dive into today's analysis and review, we have to talk about what profit is. We have to kind of define our terms because that is the totality of this chapter and is really going to stem into a much greater lesson within this chapter that really extends to the broader lesson in economics that I think Hazlitt is going for with this entire book. And that is that profit, and I've said it, if I said it one time, I've said it a hundred times, profit is nothing more than an indicator of value. And not only just an indicator of the value of the good or service being exchanged, but the value of the transaction itself. And of course, not only just to the parties involved, but to the greater economy and to the greater community as a whole. Thus, the, the profit isn't just an indicator of value of those things. It's also an indicator of where and how to direct scarce resources. So before we can go on with our analysis and review of this chapter, we do have to go ahead and just explain Smith's lesson. So Smith's lesson is something that is derived from Adam Smith and his series on uh, the wealth of nations. I actually read that on this channel. I'll put a link in this video's description to that series so you can follow along there. And I also explain this in greater detail uh, in my series on interference, which is on my other channel. I'll put a link to that series as well in this video's description. So the very brief version is that, and this only applies to a proper free market, a free market being a market free from interference, interference being interference with mutually tr consensual transactions. In a free market, any time that you have a mutually consensual exchange between parties where there is mutual consent between all parties, all parties gain. In the case of the video that I put out on interference, I use the example of Farmer Brown versus Farrier Smith. In this case, what I did was I removed currency from the exchange to make the conversation a little bit more simplified. In this case, Farmer Brown exchanges his oats for Farrier Smith's farrying services to shoe his horses, who he feeds with oats. Excuse me. <clears throat> And the excess of those, that production of oats is what Farmer Brown uses to exchange for the ferrying services with Farrier Smith. In this case, however many oats they agree to, Farmer Brown isn't going to exchange more oats than the ferrying services is worth to him. In this case, would, however much the ferrying services is worth to him, he won't, he's actually going to gain. So in this case, uh, in, in the case of Farrier Smith, Whatever his time, his energy, and, and the cost of goods sold in this case is worth to him is going to be something he's going to exchange for more oats than what it's worth to him. So the ferrying services is worth to the ferrying farrier less than the amount of oats that he's getting. And to the farmer, the amount of oats that Farmer Brown is giving to Farrier Smith is worth less, is worth less to him than the ferrying services. This is self-evident, otherwise the exchange wouldn't happen. In the case of you going to buy a candy bar at the gas station, you wouldn't buy the candy bar unless you thought it was worth less than the dollar bills you're exchanging for it. You give away the dollar bills because you think they're worth less than the candy bar. And the, the uh, gas station attendant or the owner of the gas station prices his, uh, prices his candy bar in a way that reflects the fact that he would rather have the currency than he would the Snickers bar. You would rather have the Snickers bar than the currency. Farmer Brown would rather have his shoes, his horses shoed, than having those oats. Farrier Smith would rather have those oats than the time, energy, and iron that he spends in shoeing Farrier's horses. In this case, they both gain. How does how do you build 
you know, an, an ethical system based around the free market in this example. How do you deal with things like theft? Well, theft is not an element of a free market because in this case, if Farmer Brown, if Farrier Smith just steals the oats, Farmer Brown hasn't consented to that part of the transaction. In this case, theft is not an element of a free market. And in this case, you need some way to restore consent to the transaction in order to arrive back at a free market. So that's how, in this case, we can arrive at a, an, an ethical legal system surrounding a free market. We have, to, we have to base everything on consent. In order to prevent children from working dangerous jobs in factories, you agree that children don't have the ability to consent. So that's how you can, in a free market, use the free market to build a moral, moral and ethical legal framework for oversight of that free market. So the amount that both of these people, that Farmer Brown and Farrier Smith gain, which is a perceptive thing, varies, <clears throat> excuse me, varies based on the transaction. It's not going to be the same with every transaction. But the degree to which they gain in that transaction, they both gain in that transaction, as measured by the profits in this case, is, a, it is the thing that directs the investments. So if, for example, excuse me, if the farrier can get a ton of oats for not a whole lot of ferrying services, then an outside investor will say, well, why don't we get him Farrier Smith ferrying all the horses? Because he can make a ton of money. Well, in order for him to do that, he needs to expand his shop. He needs to buy more equipment. He needs to buy and start employing people. And of course, when you employ people, you wind up paying them before you make money off of before you make money off of them. So he needs some way to get his hands on a ton of capital. And that's where the investor comes in. And that's where the investor is, is looking to, to take his money and take out a risky venture for the for the prospect of a huge return. And we'll come back to that in a minute. What investment, how investments work into this conversation. But to remind people, when it comes to Farrier Smith, when it comes to your candy bar at the grocery store, prices are set to maximize profits regardless of the system. That doesn't mean that prices are just going to be set to infinity because there is such a thing as the demand curve and the Laffer curve is real. As prices increase, the quantity of demand for that same good will tend to decline. Therefore, you need to charge the highest price the market will bear. And that's a price that is be below infinity and above zero. If you cannot possibly turn a profit based on what the market will bear for the price of the good, the good will vanish. Productivity will vanish. Cathode ray tubes. You can't possibly turn a profit manufacturing cathode ray tube televisions today. Therefore, none are manufactured. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. But the point is that prices are still going to be set to maximize those profits, regardless of the system. And because of this, markets were emergent, even in Soviet Russia. People found a way to exchange in a mutually consensual manner to make exchanges of goods and services that subverted, of course, the, the governmental control over that means of production and just, and in, as a result, found a way to um, take advantage of where there were material advantages, where there were a marketable advantages that you could use to gain more from your transaction because people wanted the thing more. So we're going to come back to that concept in just a minute too. But again, as mentioned, you can't just set prices into infinity. And I know what the response is going to be. Well, what if everybody just does a handshake deal behind scenes, the scenes? And what we're talking about here is collusive anti-competitive behavior. True. If you have collusive anti-competitive behavior, you can fix prices. And we'll come back to that, the price fixing idea in just a quick second. But collusive anti-competitor is not an element of free market. The consumer winds up becoming a, a, a party to that transaction and does not consent to that transaction. And the reason that you, you the consumer isn't consenting to that transaction and is a party to that tra transaction is because of avoidance. If I have a, a, the gas station that has that candy bar at a certain price, I can say, you know what, I you and I are not going to come to terms on this price. So I'm going to go to another gas station and then we are going to have our own terms 
about this price. The problem is that the prices that when you have the two gas stations agreeing to fix prices so that I can't avoid that price, what they've introduced is a party to that transaction, the other gas station that is actually doing the negotiation. And I haven't consented in that case to the other gas station getting their hands in that in the conversation and transaction between me and that second gas station. So there's a third party that winds up being introduced into that transaction that I haven't consented to as a consumer. So in this case, avoidance of a transaction in a free market is an element of a free market. You must be able to avoid a transaction, to escape a transaction. Otherwise, you probably don't have a free market in the sense that you know, if, there, if there's only one producer of that candy bar, if there's only one gas station in town, one way to avoid that price is if another gas station comes into town and competes with that gas station in a free market for that price. And I go and negotiate a different price with them. Again, if you have collusive anti-competitive behavior, one, of the, one way that you would prevent that from happening is to go to them, to go to that gas station and perpetually fix prices or do things like briefcasing gas stations not to come into town. Um, so <clears throat> we're going to come back to price fixing in a minute, but this is this is Smith's lesson. This is the basic lesson that Smith introduced in, 19, in 1776 and is... It's, it's kind of an axiomatic truth. It's a self-evident element of the human condition that cannot possibly be avoided. When you have mutually consensual transactions, both parties win. And when you have a huge win on those parties, if you have a huge profit in those wins, then that's a way to direct scarce resources. That is a way to, that is an indicator of where to ha to conduct those transactions, where to place the investment that allows those transactions to take place as often as possible. So before we move on to, to expand upon profit as an indicator of value, we have to have a quick conversation on accounting. So in the world of accounting, there is this thing called the ledger. When we talk about profits, what we're not talking about is gross profits. Gross profits are not net income. Gross profits being revenues minus the cost of goods sold. And it isn't even distributed equity. To, to, and net income, it's sorry, isn't even distributed equity. So what we're talking about here is effectively distributed equity. How much goes into the owners of a business's pockets once everything has been calculated? So if you ever see something like, I don't know, uh, the uh, some... Uh, the football program at a college college campus uh, has a revenue of X dollars. Well, that doesn't tell you anything. What you need is the gross profits. In this case, the gross, in fact, you don't want just the gross profits because there's the cost of goods sold. And then there's who winds up getting that money into their pocket. Where does that pocket go? Well, there are no owners. They're usually nonprofit entities. Therefore, the distributed equity is actually zero. That's the definition of a nonprofit. So for those of us who, if there's any questions about the ledger, that's something you guys should be looking into. You should be doing a serious uh, lesson in accounting that I don't have time for on this channel uh, and filling out a ledger. Uh, and oftentimes, one of the problems you see with with detractors from all of these concepts is that they've never seen a ledger and they cannot tell the difference between gross profits and net income, let alone the difference between net income and distributed equity. So getting back to the lesson of profit as an indicator of value in term, as it relates to investments specifically, huge profits just means we as consumers really, really want the commodity. And that directs investors. So when we have, uh, and the converse of this is true. Um, so let's, let's talk about the, the we as consumers. If somebody is able to make a ton of money off of us, it's because we as consumers really, really want the thing. So let's talk about, let's say, lawn mowing. If I mow somebody's lawn and I charge them, say, 100 bucks, if there's a ton of profit in that, that means that the person who's paying me to mow their lawn really, really doesn't want to mow their lawn. If, they, if, we are, if I'm working in a neighborhood where there's a lot of people that are really unwilling to, to have somebody else mow their lawn or just kind of can't afford a high price, what that means is they don't really, really want somebody else to mow their lawn. In that case, I'd have to charge 80 bucks, let's say, to mow their lawn per mow. And if they're still unwilling to do it, then they don't really, 
really want me to mow their lawn because they would sacrifice a lot of other things if they really, really wanted me to mow their lawn. That's what afford means in this case, right? Like what are you willing to afford? What are you willing to sacrifice to gain the thing? In the case of somebody who's super, super rich, maybe they really, really just don't want to mow their own lawn and they, ha- and they have the excess human capital, which we'll come back to in a minute, to pay me the hundred bucks to, to mow their lawn. And maybe they have so much of this excess human capital that I say, I, that I say you know what, I'm going to charge 120 bucks and still remain competitive in the market. And if they don't really really want me to pay to do mow their lawn, they won't pay that 120 bucks. And this is where this is how all of this directs investment, which we'll get into in in a moment, but the converse of this is true as well, like I just described. If there isn't any money, if there isn't a huge amount of of profits to be had in an arena, there won't be a whole lot of investment. Hazlitt makes this point on 161 and basically sums out the lesson that we're having in this entire in this uh in this chapter. If there is no profit in making an article, it is a sign that the labor and capital devoted to its production are misdirected. Again, profit is nothing more than an indicator of value. The perfect place to have this discussion as it relates to investment is in prescription drugs. So with the when it comes to prescription drugs and medicine, generally speaking here in the United States, Getting a prescription drug to market, getting an element of medicine to market involves a colossal investment cost. A lot of this is because of the regulatory environment here in the U.S. as opposed to other countries. But the point is that there is a huge amount of investment. And as a result, and in, in particular, uh, and as well as that colossal investment cost, there is also a huge amount of risk involved. So in, when we talk about risk, this is the risk of basically um, uh, of, of failure, right? So this is the risk of, if you're talking about a, a, an investment risk in a bank, it's the, the risk that the bank goes under. That There is a, an investment risk that the particular prescription drug either never makes it to market or just has nowhere near enough value in the market to make its investment worth the investment. In this case, the return on the investment winds up being very limited. So when you have a colossal investment cost and a huge amount of investment risk, you expect a huge payout. You wouldn't take all of your money and give it to your buddy to open up a car dealership a buddy that you know isn't that great with money. That's a huge investment risk. There's a really good chance that that money you just gave him not only doesn't return a profit, not only doesn't have a return on the investment, but just goes up in flames and you never get a dime back for it. If we, as I mentioned before, when we talk about the prices of things like prescription drugs, very often you'll, you'll hear stories about a prescription drug that's just like, an enormous, enormous price is attached to that prescription drug. If we really want the drugs, we pay the prices, which means that this is an indicator of a good investment. As in, this is something that has provided so much good to the consumers in an economy that they're willing to pay anything for it. You know, this is something like, um, like, like, various vaccines in the in the early 20th century. This is something like diabetes medication. People are willing to pay anything for it once it's once it exists. So, that's a great place to direct investment resources. That's a great place to spend time, energy and money on research and development. Otherwise, those things wouldn't exist. Hazel explains that on page 161 as well. While the risk of losing one's entire capital still exists, what is likely to what is likely to be the effect on the profit incentive and hence on employment and production. So what that means is if you don't have the opportunity to have a huge profit when it comes to those prescription drugs, then you won't get that directed investment. You won't get investors that say, here's a whole pile of money to spend the time, energy, and money 
on that research and development, which means all of those chemists lose their jobs, or at least the potential for those employments vanishes. All of the people working at those facilities lose their jobs. The construction of those facilities is directed elsewhere. So those particular people who might be building that building, maintaining the facilities, mowing the facilities, grounds, and lawns, all of those jobs are gone. But most importantly, the drugs themselves are gone which means that all of those modern medical advances that we had in the 20th century, if there isn't, if we want to replicate that in the 21st century, then what we need is a colossal incentive to invest our our resources, our time, energy, and our money into that research and development. And if we don't have that reward on the other end, then we're not going to invest our research out there. If we're going to get, if if the money is in boner pills, then you're going to have a lot more investment in boner pills, just like the opening sequence to Idiocracy. So in that case, we're going to pull research and development away from one thing and direct it towards another. And that's what happens when you get price fixing. If you don't have that investment in, if you don't have that investment in that, in the, that medicine, you're going to have that medicine that in that particular life-saving medicine, let's say, it's going to be in some other form of medicine, or it's going to be in car dealerships, or it's going to be in lawn mowing companies. In that case, what you wind up getting is a shortage because the actual demand is reflected in that profit. The actual thing that we would rather have instead of the dealerships is the medicine. If we're not allowed, if, if you have a price that that caps how much profit you're allowed to make on, say, a, a diabetes medication, then all of those resources are going to be directed to things that we self-evidently would not rather have. We would rather have the diabetes medicine. But if there's no way to make a ton of money in that, they're going to be all that investment is going to go somewhere else. And because of this, as we meant, as I've mentioned in another video that I'll link in this video's uh, description, price fixing causes shortages. It causes shortages of goods and services, which means it causes shortages of employment, which means it causes unemployment. Again, I did a video on this that explains this in much greater detail. Link is in this video's description. Check it out. But the lesson here when it comes to risk, too, it's high risk, high reward. When we have a situation where we have a high risk investment, as in, and I should have used this word before, there's a high, great, a really good chance that the investment defaults. So, and d- default means it is worth nothing. Uh, in the case of a bank, for a bank to default, it takes a, an awful, awful lot. In the case of a car dealership, if you're investing in a car dealership, it doesn't take an awful lot for that investment to default. So you would expect an investment in, say, a savings account to have a very low interest rate. Yet, if you were to give a loan to a car dealership, you'd expect that interest rate to be much higher. High risk, high reward. Everyone knows this from the lottery. If your odds of of winning are one in a jillion, no one's going to play the lottery unless the reward at that one in a jillion is a jillion dollars. So in the case of the Powerball, the odds of winning the Powerball are something like one in 185 million, which means you'd have to buy 185 million tickets before you would predict a victory, before you would predict a return, which means that in order for you to have that return, ignoring taxes, ignoring the fact that it's paid out as an annuity, you'd have to have hundreds of millions of dollars on the other side of that jackpot for it to be worth the investment. Even if you're only buying one ticket, the chances that that ticket wins is one in, the chances that that, that ticket loses is 99.99999. And you're betting against that odd with that, say, $2 investment in that lottery. Other forms of the lottery have lower risk, Say, let's say there's a chance the chances of you winning the jackpot are one in 10,000. But in the, as a result, the jackpot payout isn't nearly as much as it is with the Mega Millions or the Powerball. So, this is something that we all just kind of know if because we've engaged in the world and we've engaged in the greater economy in here in the US. Dangerous jobs pay more. They're, uh, you know, uh, landscaping is an incredibly dangerous job. It's physically exhausting, but requires absolutely no skill, absolutely no education. Barely comprehending any English is all you need to be able to do to push a lawnmower. However, those jobs tend to be incredibly dangerous. So because there's that high risk, 
of, in this case, default, uh, you know, if you die, that's kind of like a high risk calculation, um, or you get seriously injured on the job, high risk, you expect a higher return. The other thing is that, and now I'm, we're getting a little bit long winded here, so we're just going to be brief on the, on risk. Employees assume much less of the built-in risk than the investor because the investor can lose everything that they've invested into it. In the case of the employee, they haven't invested anything into it. As in, at the end of the day, not only can the profits, the, the money that goes into the owner's pockets become zero, it can become negative. In the case of the employee, the money that goes into their pockets isn't ever going to be negative. As in, they can, in, the, in theory, uh, move on to another job right? Like it's not like they've taken something and put it into that company. It's not like they've taken money out of their pocket and handed it to the company. And that's what an owner does. Uh, And that excess human capital that is created when the investor invests that money, right? Like if you have something that you're able to do and you have an excess in that skill that you're able to, you know, pay somebody else to work with, that's the thing that creates that employment. So in this case, basically what's happening is if I'm really, 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 really good, and Hazlitt explains this, that like when you reduce that most of, of the greatest profits in this in the world come from a reduction in costs, not an increase in prices. So if I'm really, 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 really efficient and really good at mowing a lawn, then I might be able to make more money than my competitor. And as a result, because I have that excess built-in skill, that excess built-in capability, or that excess just built-in work ethic, or desire to assume certain risks, I can use that money to employ more people. And that's that excess is what creates employment in the first place. Um, so just as a quick review, because we are getting way too long here, I'll just say about this chapter that I really like the chapter and I really like to read, but I should point out that these examples are dated. Uh, the, the, the the mention of General Motors as, quote, the greatest uh, industrial corporation in the world, that that's a really dated claim. Remember, this book was written in 1940-something and was most recently updated in the early 70s. Uh, the numerical percent of profit, by the way, too, is a weak argument against the detractors. So the arguments I've just presented for the free market and for free enterprise and for and against price controls are the arguments you should be making. In the beginning, he presents the numerical percent of profit. Well, what is the, the correct numerical percent of profit? And even Hazla wouldn't be able to tell you where, what a good threshold for that is. The point being that you shouldn't have to. And this is why this is a weak argument. You shouldn't necessarily point out that it's 5 or 6% because somebody might just say, oh my God, 5 or 6%, that's so much money if you think about it in terms of billions and billions of dollars. You know, 5 or 6% of billions of dollars is still, hundred, is still you know, millions upon millions and millions of dollars. So that is a weak argument, and yeah, the examples are dated, but the lesson is still the same and just as good as it was in 1776 and in the 1940s and his updates in the 1970s. So that's been uh, tonight's read. We will continue in this series with our next read, which will be uh, chapter 23, The Mirage of Inflation. So until then, this has been Mike, signing off.